Hi everyone, it's great to see a full audience. And uh, I'm Ioana, I'm a Dirk journalist, and joining me on stage is Dimitri, the founder and CEO of Flow Health. It's great to have you here, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, my second uh, visit uh, of Slush, and uh, last time I was here in 2016, we just started Flow, and uh, I was walking around and uh, watching presentations, and uh, I couldn't imagine that one day I would be invited to a big station slash. And then, like nine years after, <laughs> then I was invited, and it's my second time. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. For oh, that's amazing. I'm really happy you're here on stage this time, like you said. And it's really great because, uh, because Flo achieved a remarkable milestone by becoming the first Fantech unicorn in Europe. So before we dive into uh, the journey of how you made this happen, I'd like to start a bit more broadly uh, and ask you what's your view on the very well-documented data gap on women's health and what's the role of femtech companies here? It's a very well-known problem and uh, the problem is much, much bigger than just that uh, Femtech is uh, developed much less than necessary. It's overall about uh, uh, female health and uh, research for female health and uh, progress in female health. Uh, for example, uh, you may know that uh, for dozens of years, uh, no new drugs were developed for endometriosis or for mm -hmm. PCOS, and uh, such disease uh, touch uh, 10, 20 percent of all women. And the reason, many reasons, and very often these uh, reasons uh, are pretty much uh, commercial or around uh, very significant uh, societal problems. For example, up to the very recent uh, times, the uh, topic of menopause was completely ignored, completely. Uh, and just recently, maybe two years back, uh, people started to talk about that uh, and uh, some uh, finances was unlocked for research, like many companies emerged, but before that, like almost uh, mm -hmm. nothing was happening for this stage of life and uh, it's almost 10 years and it's touched half of population and inevitably touched and with very severe symptoms. Why? It's societal. Like, why mm -hmm. menopause, premenopause was uh, taboo? Why menstruation was uh, taboo? Many, many reasons. And uh, I believe that uh, it's the uh, role of companies like Flo is uh, not just to create a product, but also to change the narrative and uh, change the perception of uh, women and uh, people around different uh, issues and uh, problems. And we really may make this impact uh, because just imagine that uh, Flow has 70 million monthly active users and uh, in the United States 25% of all women younger than 45 are monthly active users, uh, monthly active users. Uh, not people who installed, but monthly active users. And for example, in UK, among 20 years old women, 40% of all users, of all women, are monthly active users. And of course, we may educate uh, our users and we may even change cultural narrative being like a trustworthy, trustworthy partner of uh, so significant part of population. And mm -hmm. ultimately, it's uh, our role as a company, not just like us. Uh, self subscription for our product, but really be a driving force in changing of uh, this uh, societal taboos. Mm -hmm. And do you think that things are changing now, that, that things are getting better for, for the Femtech market? What's the current state? Unfortunately, I can't say that uh, things are getting better. I may say that maybe things are even getting worse because it was some uh, period of uh, optimism, uh, maybe 2017, 18, maybe a bit earlier, and then uh, investors they got disappointed uh, because uh, of absence of return, and now like a lot of skepticism about this field, and we had tremendous uh, problems uh, raising money because of this skepticism. But I hope that our success with uh, fundraising and uh, we raised the biggest digital health uh, around this year. 230 million recently from General Atlantic, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, funds in the United States. 
it will be very helpful to the next generation of uh, startups in this field because then like, you will show that it's possible to create successful business, massive business, and uh, investors will be much more open to this idea. And for us, it was quite uh, difficult. Okay. And where there's, I mean, like you mentioned, there's a, a persistent funding gap in Femtech, and it's even more evident uh, when it comes to companies that are led by, by women. And where do you attribute this, this funding difficulty? I think uh, it's a uh, complicated issue, but I would say that ultimately it's a vicious cycle because uh, investors, they act uh, based on benchmarks. They see mm -hmm. benchmarks like IPOs, uh, unicorn successful exit and uh, they start to believe in field and then they start to invest and when they don't have uh, benchmarks they are skeptical and they don't want to invest and then but when they're not investing how this uh, unicorns would uh, happen and it's pretty much kind of vicious cycle and uh, almost like a circle uh, and uh, how can it be changed i believe that it can be changed uh, by stories of success, but also we see that more and more very persistent and energetic female founders are coming to our industry. And uh, I believe that uh, maybe in five years we will see many unicorns because uh, our field is immense and mm -hmm. uh, very, very underserved and uh, competition is not high, honestly. And mm -hmm. uh, it's like a ton of opportunities. And, but of course, uh, many skepticism as well and uh, it's necessary to be very stubborn to achieve uh, results, but uh, like, uh, I'm more optimistic about next uh, five years than I was about previous five years. And, uh, and again, I hope that success of law will unlock uh, like an easier journey for the next generation. Because mm -hmm. we just didn't have uh, something to show to investors, like, look, like our company will be as great like, as this company X, because uh, we didn't have any company to show us uh, like a unicorn, like successful business, and uh, all investors were so skeptical about all our ideas. Mm -hmm. So you managed to navigate the fundraising process. How, how did you do that? Um, by stubbornness. Uh, we met uh, hundreds of investors and we got hundreds of no's, and it was soul-breaking experience, and it's... Uh, but, uh, like, uh, it's necessary to find like, a person who would believe in uh, you, and sometimes it takes uh, many, many, many meetings and much stubbornness to find such a person. Because ultimately, it's not even about fund. It's about a concrete person who would want to pioneer your deal in investment committee, and uh, you have many things uh, to match to find such a person. This person should understand this field. Not so many <laughs> people understand this field naturally, yeah. and not so many female investors. And it's getting like, pretty difficult from the very beginning. Then mm -hmm. skepticism, then B2C is out of fashion, and you're getting like more, 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 more narrow funnel, and what could mm -hmm. you do? Like, you just need uh, to meet many people and be compelling as possible and uh, believe in uh, your mission and just understand that uh, it's a kind of rule of game. You need to meet hundreds of investors to get one yes, hundreds of no's, but it's... Uh, it's uh, really difficult, I would say. I can imagine. And you started, like you mentioned, about nine years ago. So it's been a long journey. And I would like to ask you, uh, what were the biggest challenges you had to face during the early stages of the company? Nobody believed in uh, our idea. And not just among investors, but also it was really difficult to hire employees because uh, it was just not fancy and uh, we had our engineering mostly in Eastern Europe, what made that even more difficult because uh, like um, uh, Eastern European engineers, they are famously <laughs> uh, straightforward, I would say, <laughs> in soft uh, terms. And uh, yeah, they were very skeptical to join our company and uh, it was really difficult to convince uh, them and uh, uh, it was a difficult journey because when uh, nobody believes in your idea and nobody believes in your company, so, so you just need to be really, really stubborn. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so you've mentioned stubbornness a lot of times so far. It seems like it's a very important yeah, element. Yeah, but again, it was the same problem as, uh, uh, as we had later. Like, like uh, we didn't have uh, something to show even he, our new employees that, like, look, like, join this uh, company and your work will be very mission-driven, but also you have opportunity to get a uh, a lot of money because of stock options, because this company will become big. Like uh, nobody believed in that because uh, we didn't have like a something to show to them, and uh, uh, much skepticism. And the skepticism was the most difficult, I would say. Okay, so nobody believed at the beginning, but you did. And at which point did you start seeing signals of product success? It was uh, from the very beginning, because. Uh, retention was very high. In the first version of product, I showed very high retention. And uh, then we did very simple calculations that if retention is so high and uh, most of women use period trackers, then it's a huge potential to achieve big mal. But it was part of uh, problems. Like the second part of problem was uh, to create product with the monetization potential because uh, exactly. the tracker is uh, it's, uh, just like a tool. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. a very useful tool, but it's just a tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same as calculator. Like all mm -hmm. people, they need calculators, but uh, you can't build uh, like a business and uh, create a lot of value based on calculator. And ultimately, like the main reason of our success was our uh, idea to create kind of super app. Our idea was to take period tracker as a driver of retention and engagement and surround this period tracker by kind of more sophisticated uh, features for health like symptom checkers, uh, content, chatbots, uh, special modes like for pregnancy and trying to conceive to create kind of this big platform, super app based on period tracker. And it was a really contrarian idea for the moment because uh, common sense was you should have a standalone product for each user case. And uh, it was very risky and very expensive bet, and we spent many years to achieve this vision. And uh, we spent, uh, up to this moment, we invested just the product uh, close to 200 million like, to achieve this uh, vision. But then, because of this uh, heavy bet on product, and the product should be available, create much value, uh, it was the ultimate reason why Flow became the single really monetizable and, um, app uh, at this market. And when you have uh, proper monetization, then you may unlock flywheel of growth. You mm -hmm. get more users, and then users pay to you more money. You, you, know, you hire more people, you create better product, better product generate more money, you hire more people, and it's <laughs> kind of it's, uh, just speeding itself. And how, you, since uh, because of the importance that retention has, how did, did you build, uh, how did you increase the lifetime value of your offering so that you can ensure retention of users? Uh, lifetime value is a combination of uh, two factors. Like you need to propose something what's about uh, significant uh, pain, significant issue, and also like uh, users should use your product for a very long time. And we have resolved the problem of usage for a very long time from the very beginning because of period tracker. Mm -hmm. Oh, like uh, we got... Uh, oh. Everything okay? But, yeah. But then, uh, uh, ultimately, monetization of flow was based on uh, these uh, uh, features uh, which were creating much more value. For example, we have uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, Symptom checkers, which helps to understand uh, do you have signs of a disease like, disease like PCOS or endometriosis. Or we have uh, special modes which help mm -hmm. uh, to become pregnant uh, fast and healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, such uh, kind of pro um, parts of product which create like very concrete value for very concrete moments, it's, uh, it's a driver of our monetization. But driver of mm -hmm. our retention is mm -hmm. still period tracker. Okay, it's a period tracker. So. Also, as you kept growing, were there any moments that you thought that you had to pivot a bit or change your scaling approach because of different challenges or learnings, perhaps? Honestly, not. But for a while, we just didn't know would our idea work or not. Because like this idea, okay, 
like, let's create this super app based on period tracker, like the first question was, but why users of period tracker even engage to all these features around period tracker? And uh, nobody really knew answer, because uh, like, uh, pro such products, such super apps, it didn't exist at that uh, moment. And we just had him make kind of leap of faith, make this bet, and they create this product. But Pretty much this vision is the same vision as uh, we had at the very beginning, but we just expanding mm -hmm. the product. For example, we just started our mode for perimenopause, and uh, it will be very big focus for our next year, mm -hmm. and a very big investment we are planning to do. And uh, potentially we may continue expanding our product. For example, to create like a, a special mode for postpartum, baby mode, uh, mm -hmm. like potentially digital contraception, potentially modes for irregular cycles. It means it's a huge expansion potential, and uh, we don't think that uh, we are limited uh, by our uh, model and our market. We just need to build even more. Okay, just need to build even more. And uh, regarding that, because you, you are a mission-driven company, as you say, and uh, it, to my understanding, combining a mission with profit is not always easy. So I'm wondering if you have had to do any different trade-offs or how do you approach this as a CEO? Trade-offs? You know, like... Uh, what I definitely learned from scale of our company, and now we have uh, more than 500 employees and uh, maybe 40, 40, 50 teams or so, mm -hmm. I didn't expect that the biggest uh, issue of a uh, big organization would be focus. That it's really difficult to focus such an organization on something uh, because it's pretty natural dynamics that like, like many ideas, many resources, like, uh, like ambitions of leaders, ambitions of teams, and then like, uh, and everything is so good and everything is so nice and it's, uh, we want to do everything simultaneously. And then you have 100 initiatives in parallel, and everything moves very slowly. And it's really difficult to focus organization with 40 teams to do something, mm, to do just several initiatives, but uh, faster. And mm -hmm. uh, to collaborate, uh, well, I would say that uh, I didn't expect that it uh, would be the biggest challenge of a bigger organization. Okay. And uh, another very important element, since we were talking about user retention and gaining more and more users, is definitely building consumer trust in order to have users that will keep on using the app. But in the case of Flow and similar, similar companies, we're talking about two very important elements. The first one is the accuracy of it, because it's a health-related offering, and then it's also data privacy. So I would like to ask you on both. Uh, firstly, how do you validate and ensure medical accuracy? And then we can move to data. Medical accuracy was uh, a kind of a very significant uh, element of our culture from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, maybe the second year of existence of Flow, uh, we didn't have money to buy like a proper furniture for our bigger office, but I decided to hire American doctors to check our content and we used just like an old mixed furniture at that moment. And now we have a quite big medical team, maybe 20 doctors inside the floor, and we have more than 100 medical specialists out of the floor, and we have very strict process. It means that uh, uh, our internal team first check each piece of content and algorithm, and then our external advisors, they check each piece of content and mm. uh, algorithm, and then we have like a kind of stamp, like who among our professors che checked each piece of content, it's almost personal responsibility. And then we have 75 million monthly active users and among probably hundreds of thousands of doctors, and each time when we have some, like maybe minuscule detail, like questionable, we are getting like immediate feedback from them that, ah, like, let's look here, like, well, you should maybe recheck, reconsider, and it's very good to have so significant audience because feedback is immediate when, like, something is uh, maybe not even not right, but, like, questionable because sometimes it may be, like, a different opinions about mm -hmm. something. And, of course, we are very serious about privacy and security. We are the single company at the market which got uh, simultaneously ICO certification in 
privacy and ICO certification in security and uh, we got many security and privacy awards especially for our anonymous mode for example we become like a, we got uh, like a, um, innovation award for time magazine last uh, year because mm -hmm. of uh, anonymous mode and uh, and we are very strict i believe that uh, our standards in privacy and security are better than in 99% per, of uh, all apps, and, uh, and uh, we are continuing to invest in that. Maybe we have uh, uh, female leaders for privacy and security, human vice presidents, and uh, total, and maybe 20, 30 people who work uh, for privacy and security in our company. We spent millions to ensure that uh, it's like we are very good in that. Mm -hmm. And how important is transparency, transparency on how user data are being used? Because we're talking about very sensitive data. Yeah, uh, in our case, we have uh, total transparency and uh, also we have the single business model, the paid subscription. We don't have uh, any other business models. And uh, it's like, uh, naturally, this business uh, model is uh, kind of doesn't assume any usage of uh, users' data, and we purposefully don't want to have uh, advertising in our app, not to create like perception that uh, our app is not private enough, and uh, it was our strategic decision to never have uh, advertising in Flow. Okay, and you you built two apps before Flow, correct? Um, we built. Uh, we, built, we have built two period trackers before Flow became successful. It means that we failed okay. two attempts. But we learned from these attempts, and uh, attempt number three became successful. But uh, before that, yeah, we spent few years uh, for unsuccessful attempts. But I would not say that attempts were unsuccessful. It means that we learned from them, and then like, we created a product which became successful. But okay. uh, again, it was not kind of immediate success. We tried twice, failed twice, persisted, and first time it became success. So with persistence and stubbornness, you, you, you went through all the way and you are now, uh, you have reached unicorn status, which is a first for, for Europe and Fantech. How do you view your role as a, a male CEO in, in, in a space that addresses women's needs? In, in Femtech, uh, it's, um, Flo is not the first unicorn. There are uh, much bigger companies like Maven, for example, in the United States or Kindbody. Probably not bigger, but similar of size, like Progeny. It's the first FinTech unicorn of Europe. In the United States, no, we uh, got uh, maybe five FinTech uh, unicorns or, or so. And uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, my role and uh, my gender. Like, uh, we, from the very beginning, we developed uh, a very robust system that we are not making decisions based on my opinion. We, are, we have a uh, Mm -hmm. Up to this moment, we have finished approximately 1,000 of user researches, and we have maybe 20 user researchers who are talking with uh, people in our company, and also we are analyzing uh, data. And uh, like our product is built by as a result of this uh, objective analysis and uh, communication with uh, users, and also most of flow. Uh, most of law employees and most of managers are female. And again, like I'm just like a one person from 500. Maybe I may, may be making like one percent of decisions, maybe less. Like it's like it's a big machine, and uh, it would be not right to say that. Oh, like Flo is uh, Dmitry. No, Flo is not Dmitry. I have my functions, but I'm just a function. I'm just like a, I don't like this idea that CEO should be glorified like 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 rating of uh, CEOs in Glassdoor, etc. Because uh, especially for big organizations, it's just a job and it's just a function. And I have like my responsibilities and I'm trying to like work well. And as unfortunately we have only about a minute left, uh, I would like to, to close this conversation with, uh, with some advice that you would like to offer to founders in the space. I think uh, ultimately the most significant is just to try because uh, you need to buy a lottery ticket because then you may win, you may lose. The more lottery tickets you buy and the more chances you get. Uh, but the main problem is not you buy a lottery ticket. And uh, often people, they just like uh, 
dreaming about something, but they never buying lottery tickets. It means that uh, sometimes it's better to stop hesitating and you can't predict future and everything will be very different than you think and our plans never work the same way as we had all our business plans failed, like uh, everything was very different, but it was significant just to try. And uh, my suggestion is sometimes just like uh, stop doubting and try. You have not so, many, not so much to lose, honestly. Like uh, you, all people who are successful, the single common denominator of them, they just tried. They're very different, but they just tried at some moment. And you also should try, maybe several times, maybe five, maybe seven. But uh, <laughs> ultimately, you will get your success. That's a very optimistic message, I think. Thanks, Dimitri, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Okay.